Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our third session for the morning in this our 150th period of sessions. I would like to welcome all of you to this hearing, which is on the impact of stand your ground laws on minorities in the United States. I'm particularly pleased to welcome representatives of the state. I don't have those who are uh, all, of, well, I have some of the names, but I think it would be best if you introduce yourselves because we weren't sure who was representing you this morning. And I have with me, though, um, a list in terms of the applicants who will be sitting at the table with us. I welcome you also. We have several um, groups who are representing in this hearing, and I think that underscores the significant public interest and the public importance of this particular issue. It has been very much even in the public's eye. We have with us uh, from the University of Miami School of Law Human Rights Clinic, Caroline Bettinger Lopez and Charlotte Castle. We have from Dream Defenders, Ahmad Abusnaid, from Community of Justice Project of Florida, Mina Jaganath, from the NAACP, uh, Niaz Kazravi, and we are especially honored uh, to have with us also uh, family members of persons who have been uh, directly affected by this law, and that is Ronald Davis, who's the father of Jordan Davis, and Sabrina Fulton, the mother of Trayvon Martin, and we especially welcome you here today and acknowledge your presence. We will have the usual format of 20 minutes on each side to make the presentations, after which um, we will make some comments and ask some questions on the table, and then hopefully we will have enough time to give you a f further um, opportunity to respond to the questions and observations. We'll begin with the petitioners. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, distinguished commissioners and members of the U.S. delegation. We are grateful to the commission for this opportunity to speak on this important issue. My name is Charlotte Cassell, and I am a student attorney in the University of Miami Law School Human Rights Clinic. My colleagues and I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I would like to begin by introducing our delegation. I am joined today by Sabrina Fulton, the mother of teenager Trayvon Martin, and Ron Davis, the father of teenager Jordan Davis. Ms. Fulton and Mr. Davis lost their children to gun violence that we believe was precipitated and condoned by Stand Your Ground laws. Also with us are Professor Caroline Bettinger Lopez, Ahmad Abuznayed from the Dream Defenders, Niaz Kasravi, and Derek Turner from the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Alita Alston Ture, and Elisa Bieria from the Free Marissa Now campaign, and Mina Jaganath from the Community Justice Project of Florida Legal Services. Stand Your Ground laws have made headlines in the wake of the tragic deaths of Trayvon Martin, Trayvon and Jordan, and the appalling prosecution of Marissa Alexander, a domestic violence victim. This month, however, marks the first time that these laws are coming under scrutiny of the international community as to their human rights implications. Just two weeks ago, the UN Human Rights Committee repeatedly expressed concern that Stand Your Ground laws in the United States are incompatible with the fundamental right to life. We have seen important steps taken to address the devastating impact of Stand Your Ground laws. For example, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights has announced it will investigate the racial biases in these laws, and members of Congress have held hearings on the laws that have pushed the public discourse. Additionally, a task force was convened in Florida to investigate the laws, but resulted in no substantial change. In fact, the legislature is voting to expand the laws. In other words, we have yet to see concrete results. As my colleagues will explain in more detail, stand your ground laws violate the right to life, equality, non-discrimination, family, freedom of movement, and the rights of the child. The US government has an obligation to ensure that these rights are respected and ensured at the local, state, and federal levels. We are hopeful that this hearing today will further the conversation. The rights and safety of all Americans, young and old, black, brown, and white, male and female, must be upheld. Thank you. Good morning, esteemed members of the Commission and U.S. Delegation. My name is Dr. Niaz Kasravi, and I'm the director of the NAACP Criminal Justice Program. The NAACP is our nation's largest and most widely recognized grassroots civil rights organization 
with more than 2,200 membership units across all 50 states. In recent years, few issues have caused as much angst and raised as much concern amongst our members and the communities we serve than stand your ground laws. These laws and their application have impeded justice in the shooting deaths of innocent people who are doing nothing more than walking down the street. Since Florida passed the first Stand Your Ground law in 2005, 34 states in the U.S. have adopted, adopted some form of Stand Your Ground or Shoot First laws, which give individuals the right to use deadly force to defend themselves without any requirement to evade or retreat from a dangerous situation. Studies show that Stand Your Ground laws, much like the American justice system as a whole, are carried out in racially biased manner to the detriment of racial and ethnic minorities. A study by the Urban Institute determined that in Stand Your Ground states, when, a white, shoot, when white shooters kill black victims, 34% of the resulting homicides are deemed justifiable. When black shooters kill white victims, only 3% of those deaths are ruled justifiable. Numerous studies have also shown that stand your ground laws do not deter crime. To the contrary, justifiable homicides nearly doubled from 2000 to 2010 in states with stand your ground laws, with a sharp increase after 2005, when Florida and 16 other states passed these immoral laws. The average number of so-called justifiable homicide cases per year increased by more than 50% in the decade's latter half. Another national study by Texas A&M University revealed that homicide rates actually increased by seven to nine percent in states that have passed some form of stand your ground laws. The NAACP is staunchly opposed to stand your ground laws. They are applied in a racially biased manner. They do not deter crime. And the bottom line is, as we saw in numerous cases in Florida, they make it easier for people to murder other human beings and not face any legal consequences. Therefore, the NAACP strongly encourages the repeal of stand your ground, ground laws and the restoration of sane and sensible policies of self-defense that do not rely on antiquated and barbaric codes of the West to shoot first and ask questions later. Thank you. Good morning to the esteemed commission members. My name is Ahmad Nabil Abuznaid, representing the Dream Defenders, a youth-based human rights organization here in the United States. A national and now international dialogue has been brewing around the harmfulness of stand your ground laws, also called shoot first laws, and their implications for the rights to life, non-discrimination, and equality before the law. These laws have in a sense legalized the devaluing and dehumanizing of minority lives. We have recently heard from members of the United Nations Human Rights Committee that stand your ground laws are incompatible with the right to life. It is imperative that the federal government ensure that state and local, local governments do not promulgate laws that violate rights as fundamental as the right to life and equality before the law. SYG laws amount to state complicity in the perpetuation of violence. Research has shown that SYG laws are dangerous in terms of increasing levels of homicide and are discriminatory in their application as to race and gender. Even worse, blanket immunity and broad discretion to law enforcement offered by Florida-type SYG laws infringe on victims' access to courts and their right to a remedy. The most recent case involving the murder of Jordan Davis and the jury's deadlock on his murder count exposed just how much confusion SYG has introduced into the criminal process. As you may know, three, the three high-profile tragedies we have witnessed regarding Stand Your Ground have occurred in Florida. Florida was the first to pass such a law and should be the first to repeal such a law. The federal government must support such a repeal. On the ground in Florida, groups like the Dream Defenders, the NAACP, and other partners have been rallying around the communities that are concerned about the protection of, of life, which Stand Your Ground stands in the way of. Unfortunately, the people's call for a repeal has been ignored by the Florida legislature. Not only that, but more legislation is being sent down the pipeline to gun us down including a so-called warning shot bill, whose advocates are pushing it under the guise of support for Marissa Alexander. These law lawmakers have shown that they don't care about Marissa or our communities. Florida and other states are currently looking at laws that would arm school teachers with guns. And I would postulate that it would not be long before one of our teachers stands their ground against one of our children. 
We are not safe in our streets, our neighborhoods, gas stations, movie theaters, and yes, our schools. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Sabrina Fulton. I'm the mother of Trayvon Martin. And I just thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you um, today in reference to this subject of Stand Your Ground. Uh, Stand Your Ground, uh, I am considered a victim of Stand Your Ground as far as my son is concerned. Uh, Trayvon Martin was not doing anything wrong. And I feel we do have a problem in this country when our young teenagers are afraid to walk down the street in their communities. Um, as I go to different places in the country and I notice that people walk up to me and they said that they are actually afraid. So I just want other people to stand with me, to support me and to understand what is going on uh, with the Stand Your Ground law. It does not work for the benefit of victims. Um, my son, like I said, he's the youngest, Trayvon uh, Martin. I have another son, Javaris Fulton, but it just hurts my heart to just not be able to explain and for the uh, system not to have something in place that's clear. That law is not clear. That law does not benefit anyone. Thank you. I want to thank the commission for having us here today. My son is Jordan Davis, and he was not given his human rights. His human rights were trumped by something called the rights of stand your ground. And stand your ground all over this country is trumping the rights of human rights. They take into account the fears of other people and the biases of people, what they have in their mind. Never mind that your child or your loved one was unarmed. It's what I think they had. You don't have to have a weapon. As long as I think you have a weapon, then it's reasonable to the shooter and that's all they need to prove. What's reasonable to someone else may not be reasonable to me. We have instances across the nation, and here in Florida we had instances where someone in a movie theater threw popcorn at somebody. They shot him in the chest for throwing popcorn. Is that reasonable to anybody in this room? But to the shooter, he claimed it was reasonable to him. He doesn't know how hard popcorn could hit him in the face. We lost 20 of our babies in Newtown to the shooter, it was reasonable to walk into an elementary school of six and seven year olds and shoot those kids down where they were disfigured. Does that sound reasonable to anybody in this room? We have to look at Stand Your Ground for what it is. It's an attempt by the gun manufacturers to sell more guns through fear. We make us fear each other. We all have certain biases when you walk down the street and you see people of color hanging out on the corner and you may be a Caucasian. You have a reasonable fear. You have a bias maybe in your minds if you haven't dealt in their culture. Maybe you don't have African-American friends, Hispanic friends. So you might have a bias in your mind. You don't have a race or prejudice, but you have a little bias that, you know, maybe I should cross the street. We all experience that. You know, I can go down in towns in Louisiana where guys hunt all the time. And maybe they have their caps on and their guns. And reasonably, I have a bias that, you know what, maybe I shouldn't walk through these guys. That's okay. But you don't allow your citizens to take guns out and shoot people and kill people based on these biases, based on these fears. And that's what the gun manufacturers are doing. And in this country, our lawmakers whose campaign contributions are given by the gun manufacturers in the NRA and these people. They have fears for their jobs, so what they do is they check off on everything that the gun manufacturers want. And here we sit, like the wild, wild west, 
and we're seeing our kids murdered in the streets like animals. And I, for one, I'm not going to put up for it. I'm going to be the voice of it. And I hope you join me in saying we must re re -white, rewrite Stand Your Ground. It must be rewritten because one day that knock is going to be on your door and your children who you think may be safe because they're in a good neighborhood. It doesn't matter what neighborhood. Bullets don't know what neighborhood. And whenever somebody claims Stand Your Ground and they get away with it, everything else is collateral damage. Like Hadea Pendleton, she was shot after attending an inaugural for the president. She was in the park minding her own business, but if the person claimed stand your ground, he would get away with it because it's collateral damage. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Alita. Good morning, my name is Alita Austin Torre. I am from Jacksonville, Florida. I am co-lead of Free Marissa Now, a national campaign organizing to free Marissa Alexander. Marissa Alexander, also from Jacksonville, Florida, is an African-American mother of three and a survivor of domestic violence. In August 2010, nine days after giving birth to her youngest daughter, Miss Alexander was attacked by her husband, who assaulted her, strangled her, and threatened to kill her. She was able to retrieve her firearm and fired a single warning shot upwards into a wall to halt, halt the attack. She caused no injuries with this shot, and fortunately, her husband left the home. Despite the fact that Florida's self-defense law includes the right for domestic violence victims to stand their ground in their own homes. Ms. Alexander was arrested by Jacksonville police and charged with aggravated assault. After 12 minutes of deliberation, Ms. Alexander was convicted and sentenced to 20 years in prison due to the state's mandatory minimum sentencing laws. Ms. Alexander successfully appealed the verdict in September 2013, and her new trial is scheduled for July 28th. Florida State Prosecutor Angela Corey recently announced that she now intend to pursue a mandatory 60 years um, against Ms. Alexander. This escalation is reflective of sexual discrimination in the justice system in which black people, including black women, are over criminalized yet underprotected. The crucial connection between the devastating losses of Trayvon Martin and Jordan Davis and the state's alarming punishment of Marissa Alexander is the application of stand your ground routinely fails to value the defense of black life. The reason given for which Miss Alexander was not granted stand your ground immunity is that the judge decided she did not feel genuine fear. This is absurd but not surprising because research shows that courts often not don't perceive black women victims as sympathetic and credible. Instead, black women are characterized as aggressive, emasculating, and incapable of being victimized. Ms. Alexander herself has noted, and quote, you tell me that I can bear arms, you tell me that I can go to class and get a permit to carry, and you tell me everything that I need to do to get on the right side of the law, and then you try to dictate to me my level of fear, end quote. Astonishingly, in her Stand Your Ground hearing, Ms. Alexander's experience of being physically assaulted and threatened with death and discounted, well, while what she felt became the criterion for determining whether her self-determination, her self-defense action was protected, indeed, instead of supporting Ms. Alexander as a victim of violence, the state's attorney ultimately reinforced the domestic violence she experienced by punishing her for saving her own life. Black women and all women have the right to self-defense. Facing the possibility of 60 years in prison for defending her life from an abusive husband reflects a crisis in the law and criminal justice system as whole. Ms. Alexander's legal team recently filed a motion requesting a new stand your ground hearing, arguing that the evidence allowed to be presented at her first hearing was at best grossly incomplete. And the judge failed to evaluate her case under the correct legal standard within the statute. We very much hope that Ms. Alexander is granted a new fair hearing and given the immunity from prosecution that she should have been granted years ago. In the meantime, we must immediately reform this law to undo the ways in which structural racism and the ignored sexism drive it is applied. For example, we must take seriously how race determines the evaluation of, sub of subject subjective criteria within Sandy Ground, such as whether the defendant experienced genuine fear 
also we must examine if domestic violence victims, especially black women, are able to invoke stand your ground in a justice system that commonly blames and punishes victims who struggle to navigate and survive the conditions of violence in their lives. We strongly urge the commission to comply the United States to review and reform stand your ground statutes in order to unravel the racial and also the gender bias woven into the law's application. Thank you. Good morning, distinguished members of the commission and the U.S. delegation members. My name is Mina Jagannath from the Community Justice Project of Florida Legal Services. It is clear that the federal government has a role to play in evaluating both the public safety implications and the uneven application of these laws that send a message that certain people's lives matter more than others. Clear evidence and guidance provided by the federal government through a thorough investigation is necessary in order to provide states with the data they need to properly evaluate the impact of these laws. As is illustrated by the Florida legislature's present swift path towards expanding its stand your ground laws, with the blessings of the NRA. This has to be done at the federal level. A state-by-state -state piecemeal process of evaluating the laws would ignore the greater nationwide concerns these laws pose as to the right to life, equality before the law, and victims' access to a remedy. In addition, the federal government, if it has a political will, has the ability to take action at the federal level in a number of ways. It can enact common sense gun control laws that increase the criteria for background checks and ban access to certain types of arms and ammunition. Another solution could include conditional, conditioning federal funding to local law enforcement and other such programs on the inclusion of certain minimum protections within states' self-defense laws. For example, the elimination of stand your ground provisions that expand the justification of the use of deadly force outside of the home without imposing a duty to retreat or revising the mandatory minimum sentencing laws, which um, affected Marissa Alexander's case. Attorney General Eric Holder has taken a, an important first step on rolling back mandatory minimum sentencing laws by declaring them dracon draconian and the cause of shameful racial disparities, as well as announcing a change in the Department of Justice's position on sentencing for certain nonviolent offenses. States should follow suit. Finally, the federal government plays a key role in fixing the structural inequities within the criminal justice system and dealing with problems like racial stereotyping and sexism that produce unjust results. The U.S. government cannot hide behind federalism as a way to ignore its obligations under international human rights law. It is critically important to come up with solutions that challenge the federalism problem by using tools available to the federal government to help ensure that states' policies do not violate in fundamental human rights. Thank you. Thank you. I now ask the state to respond. Thank you very much. Uh, distinguished commissioners, petitioners, families, and secretariat colleagues. My name is Lawrence Combiner. I am the Deputy Permanent Representative of the United States Mission to the Organization of American States. I am joined here at the table by Ms. Margaret Pickering of the State Department's legal staff and Ms. Rachel Owen, also of the U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States. It is a pleasure to appear before you on this important topic, and on behalf of the United States government, I would like to once again reiterate the United States' unwavering support for the work of the Commission in protecting and promoting human rights in the hemisphere. As you know, this particular topic, and as we have heard this morning, related to the so-called Stand Your Ground laws, has been a source of much debate in the media, among legal scholars and activists and among the general public. Our Department of Justice colleagues understand that the issues discussed in this hearing are of significance to the Commission as well as to the participants of this proceeding. While it is inappropriate for the Department of Justice to participate in this hearing or provide extensive remarks due to their pending and open investigations, we highlight the 2013 statement made by Attorney General Eric Holder that, quote, we should question laws that senselessly expand the concept of self-defense and sow dangerous conflict in our neighborhoods, end quote. Separately, we should note that under our legal system, the vast majority of our criminal laws are passed and enacted by state and local elected officials, not 
the federal government. This makes it more difficult for the federal government to comment on specific state laws and their impact. The Department of Justice would also like to inform the Commission that the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights is conducting an examination of Stand Your Ground laws. The Department of Justice will review its findings and take actions as appropriate. Specific to Florida, the Department of Justice's criminal section of the Civil Rights Division, the United States Attorney's Office for the Middle District of Florida, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation continue to evaluate the evidence generated during the federal investigation as well as the evidence and testimony from the state trial. Experienced federal prosecutors will determine whether the evidence reveals a prosecutable violation of any federal criminal statutes and whether federal prosecution is appropriate in accordance with the Department of Justice's policy governing successive federal prosecution following a state trial. Right now, there is no statistical information on disparities in the application of standard ground laws. While some states have adopted such laws, these laws are not uniform in their text or scope. Some law enforcement groups have expressed concern that stand your ground laws may indeed have unintended consequences and inhibit the ability of law enforcement and prosecutors to fully hold violent criminals accountable for their acts. Commissioners, petitioners, and colleagues and family members, the United States understands that there are real concerns with these types of laws. We thank the Commission for arranging this hearing, and we thank the petitioners for presenting this valuable testimony. We value your work and research on standard ground laws, and we'll take this information into consideration in the course of our investigation. We will ensure that the remarks and evidence presented today is made available to U.S. experts and others working on these issues. Thank you. Okay, since the state um, took less time than anticipated, it gives us more time to come back to the petitioners, um, which I believe they would welcome. Um, just to say to emphasize that this hearing is not related to a petition, but it is part of our mandate uh, to promote human rights. And so it is in that spirit that we agreed to this hearing, and we are actually honored to be able to provide a forum for us to discuss this important issue and support the debate. I want to ask, first of all, uh, the Rapporteur for the United States, Commissioner Gonzalez, to give us his thoughts on the issue. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Commission, to the petitioners, and welcome again to the delegation from the government. Um, I think the, the presentations have been very uh, illustrative and significant for the Commission. Um, we are well aware that this is a, a matter of a major concern in the United States and it's very important for the Commission to have the opportunity to address it uh, in a uh, hearing like this. Um, I would like to ask the, the petitioners um, what actions would you expect the uh, federal government to take? Of course, uh, in federal states such as the U.S. or some other countries in the OAS, at the Organization of American States, the responsibility is of the federal government as a whole. Uh, also for uh, for uh, specific states' uh, actions, but um, according to the domestic legislation of the U.S., there are certain um, um, responsibilities that the the federal government uh, can take. And that's what I would like to hear from the petitioners, what the actions would you consider important for the federal government to take in this regard. Um, and I would also uh, like to hear a little bit more, um, because I, I, I understood very well the, the case that was explained here, but uh, uh, the one uh, referring to uh, domestic violence, but I did understand quite well uh, how the general, the, the pro, what the general problem would be with the um, um, stand your ground laws uh, apply, as applied to uh, cases of domestic violence. Thanks. 
Ah, uh, thank you. Um, I, I noted that the stand your ground law from the notes we have came from a common law doctrine, the castle doctrine, but it struck me that in terms of the initial common law defense, uh, it, the, the burden is initially on the person who s promotes the, 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 the defense to prove that it applies. And it seems to me that in this, what you might call a hybrid model, the stand your ground, that is not the case. So there's a lower threshold in relation to even applying the, the stand your ground law. When does it apply? So there's actually a much more liberal standard in relation, in particular in relation to the right to life. So that was something that struck me as to the application of stand your ground law in the United States. I would also like to comment about the issue of race because I stand here also as a rapporteur for the rights of persons of African descent at the commission. I have the honor to lead that rapporteurship. And in an earlier hearing, I was asking in terms of juvenile justice and the race um, implications, I was saying that, you know, the commission really has been seeking to have statistics in relation to uh, race in the criminal justice system. And we really would welcome statistics because it allows us to lay the groundwork for a claim of racial discrimination using this notion of context in particular, and we have done that successfully in, in relation to gender cases. It seems to me that in this particular hearing, you have provided um, some important statistics. I noted that the state said that there are no st statistics, but you have been doing a lot of research. That statistics is very useful for us, certainly to me in terms of the rapporteurship, because it does raise prima facie um, issues of race discrimination, which are inherent in the criminal justice system and, and, and demonstrate that there are structural patterns. So that is something I, I think that's very important for, for this and I hope that the state would accept the statistics and we, need, we hope to see more research and, and more statistics. On the issue of gender, of course, um, one just has to read the newspapers or perhaps Facebook to know about the case of um, uh, Minister Alexander. So I had been familiar with it. And in relation to that, I have a particular concern that it seems to me that there are very clear disparities in relation to um, women and probably more so Afro-American women, although the only cases I know of are Afro-American women, uh, in relation to this the application again of stand your ground laws when it comes to domestic violence. So it, 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 for me, it appears to be very inconsistent the way stand your ground laws are applied. Uh, and the one case, it seems to be a subjective standard, like in the Trayvon Martin case, it's a subjective standard in, in terms of just the application of of, of whether the defense applies. Whereas in the, in the case of Minister Alexander and other cases like that, it seems to be very much an objective standard. So even on that ground alone, um, the fact that it's inconsistent, I think that does raise issues of inequality. And I would ask, you know, what is the significance of context? I don't know if the state has anything to say about the context, but that I think is a very important um, issue for us to consider. So those are my thoughts initially about it. Um, I didn't see your hand. I don't know if the executive secretary had another comment, but I think it's more useful for us to hear more from you um, since we really rushed you um, and we were prepared to give you a bit more time. So I can give you, can I ask if the state is going to, if you would need extra time as well, because we have some extra time today, which is a very, a little unusual. Right now unexpected. we don't, not unless something comes up. Okay, so we'll give you the to. usual, probably about five minutes to respond, but I can give you um, maybe 10 minutes more um, on the petitioner's side to speak, if you wish. Maybe 12 minutes, because that would include answering the questions, including and also give you the t your initial presentations that you had to rush. So both response and so you have 12 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to respond to Commissioner Gonzalez's question about what, um, what we would like the federal government to do, um, first of all, we're very happy to hear that the Commission on Civil Rights is undertaking an investigation, and we would ask um, that it take into consideration, um, as we had mentioned, statistical research that already exists around uh, racial disparities and the effect of uh, standard ground laws on um, increase of homicide rates. We would also ask for the federal government to work with advocacy groups like ours 
to um, to ensure that that investigation is as thorough and um, far-reaching as possible. Uh, in addition to that, one suggestion that we have uh, that the federal government might be able to take at the at you know at the federal level is co perhaps conditioning funding to local law enforcement on. Um, removal, for example, of stand your ground provisions from self-defense laws uh, and, uh, and on the inclusion of a duty to retreat um, in self-defense laws in the interest of public safety. Those are some initial thoughts. Thank you. I'm Attorney Benjamin Crump, uh, the attorney for Trayvon Martin's family. I think the federal government can do a multitude of things. The first thing they can do more than anything else to help this matter is to keep the statistics that are not being kept anywhere. And those statistics talk about what happened in courtrooms when no newspapers write about them, when nobody march or protests about them, and the deaths are swept under the rug and nobody's held accountable, and vice versa when we have blacks who claim stand your ground or Hispanics, how it is unfair to them. Stand your ground is not only a bad law, it's a biased law. We have the killer of Trayvon Martin and Jordan Davis not being held accountable for actually killing a human being. However, we have Michael Giles, whose mother, Phyllis Giles, is here in the room with us. Her son, was a 26-year-old U.S. airman, has served two tours in the Middle East in Kuwait and Iraq, married three children, never committed a crime in his life. He was visiting a, a friend in college at a bar in Tallahassee, Florida. There was a fight that broke out that all the testimony said Michael Giles had nothing to do with. Yet the person who Fran was in the altercation wanted to fight somebody and he attacked Michael Giles, just hit him without provocation, knocked him on the ground, crowd gathered around him, was kicking him. He took out his gun that he had, was registered to carry, shot him in the leg. He claims stand your ground. It's different when minorities claim stand your ground versus the killers of Jordan Davis and Trayvon Martin. In this case, the alleged victim even said I was the initial aggressor. I was the person who started the altercation. Michael Giles, this U.S. airman, no criminal history, was only defending himself. This is the testimony of the alleged victim. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison. He has been in prison now for four years, and he has exhausted his appellate remedy, his only remedy now is clemency from the governor or a pardon from the president of the United States. Other than that, this young African-American soldier with no criminal history will spend the next 21 years of his life in prison. An innocent man who the alleged victim has said was defending himself. Note that to Trayvon Martin's case. His killer is free, a person who victim says he was defending himself, who happens to be of African descent, is in prison. Stand your ground is not only a bad law, it's a biased law. Uh, I would reiterate everything that has been said. Um, I would just like to highlight for the Commission and the U.S. delegation that there are statistics on the racial disparities of the application of stand your ground laws. Um, and we can send you the information if need be so that you can make sure the Justice Department has them as they are doing their investigation. But uh, the Urban Institute study that I cited in my testimony is one that comes to mind. But we'd be happy to provide information. You know, this is part of a larger problem of institutional racism within the criminal justice system. There are statistics, as you mentioned, of bias at every stage of the criminal justice system. And this issue is just symptomatic of a larger problem in the U.S. And there are, there are facts and, and numbers that we can forward to you. And I, I would just like to say that, reiterate what you mentioned about stand your ground. 
coming out of the uh, common law of, of, of castle doctrine, it basically makes you be able to treat the entire state as your castle and your home. It's one thing to have a debate and argue about whether you have a duty to retreat in your own home. It's another to create a situation where an entire state can be deemed your own castle or your own home. So these are just some of the things I would highlight be taken into consideration as you all are doing your review and assessment. My son was Jordan Davis, and his crime was sitting in a car with other 17-year-old teenagers playing their music loud. And if that's a crime, I believe all of our children in this room has committed those crimes. I think we have committed that crime. And this 45-year-old individual that pulled beside him decided, I don't like that thug music. And so he proceeds to holler at the kids, and they return some talk. He pulls out his gun and shoots at the car full of teenagers. Ten times he shoots at the car, hits the car nine times. Even as the car was pulling away, he shoots three more shots into the car as they were yards away from him. He goes into a police stance to try to shoot him and said that had they not been so far away, he would have tried to unload the rest of his magazine into the car. Witnesses all around, everybody saw what happened. Good neighborhood, very much lighting. Had no reason to fear these children. Gets back in his car, his girlfriend gets in, his fiance gets in the car. Doesn't mention anything about a weapon that the kids had because they had no weapon. They go back to their local hotel, no mention of a weapon to the girlfriend. Find out the next morning that they had killed my son. No 911 call. Matter of fact, that night that it happened, they ate pizza after they killed my son and had a rum and coke. Again, no 911 call. Drove two and a half hours back to his home in Satellite Beach, Florida. No 911 call. When they arrested him, he acted like, what's going on? I, I was standing my ground. And this is the application of the law that people think that any time they pull out a weapon and shoot people, that it's okay. That they can not even call 911. It's just business as usual. And one of the parts about stand your ground that hasn't been mentioned today, and I hate to use Commissioner Gonzalez as an example, if me and him had a problem, we had a verbal problem. At any time that I feel that I'm threatened, I can take out a weapon and shoot at Mr. Gonzalez. And if I miss him and hit the president of the commission, guess what? As long as they say I was in my rights to stand your ground and shoot at Mr. Gonzalez, that if she gets hit or anybody on the panel gets hit, it's collateral damage. I cannot be prosecuted for it. And that's all against human rights. That has to be against human rights. Um, to talk about the genuine fear um, means that to eliminate subjective criteria and understand your ground would go back to what uh, the legal defense of Marissa is doing now, which is the 144 pages that outlines um, not only why, in fact, uh, it was best grossly incomplete, but also goes into some of the things that aren't understood under uh, domestic violence, such as battered woman syndrome. Um, and and not understanding that, it goes into deeper on why this is a gender issue, because it's not explained in the courthouse or under, in the courtroom. And um, there's a piece where that subjective criterion um, talks about the genuine fear in, in detail and how vulnerable it is because for Marissa in, in, t in using the whole factor where she was guilty and had to prove her innocence, um, that is usually the case for domestic violence survivors um, under DMC, Dis Disproportionate Minority Contact. So um, what we're trying to, to say on the objective part, you know, improving uh, the genuine fear, it goes to the place where if she was in a DMC, disproportionate minority contact, if she wasn't a woman, she would be what Zimmerman was, which was innocent until proven guilty. And so what we're trying to say with stand your, stand your ground law is that 
by going back to that 144 pages, if people haven't seen that, it really speaks loud to this place of DMC not being identified, battered woman syndrome not un being understood, and the factor where do then we go to if we say the federal government should also strongly urge Florida, Governor Rick Scott, um, to drop charges against Marissa uh, for the 60 years. And it, you know, because it is cruel, unusual, and wrong. But understanding those places, those pieces, um, is bringing back that subjective criterion that we're talking about on genuine fair. Thank you. Um, I now invite the state to five minutes, if you wish. We're, we're happy to cede our time if the petitioners want to uh, have uh, present more. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, so five more minutes to wrap up. I just wanted to also say that um, that as a mother that people should, you know, just really take a look at Stand Your Ground and really understand that it's about perception. And it's very difficult as a parent to relate to a law that gives a person with a gun so much authority. Um, I don't have any problems with people that carry guns. I don't have any issues with people that carry guns as long as they are a responsible gun owner. But when a 17-year-old child, minor, is in a gated community uh, simply walking from the store with no weapon, only a drink and candy, that poses a problem for me as a mother and should pose a problem for other mothers and fathers as well. Because what it's saying to us is that we have no clue what to tell our teenagers now. I mean, how many of our teenagers walk home from the store, from the park, from the school and have to worry now about someone perceiving them to be a criminal. How many parents now are concerned about their minors just making it home, just making it home from point A to point B? And so I stand and I hopefully I'm the voice of many of those concerned parents that says this has to stop. This gun violence has to stop. This method of let's shoot first and ask questions later has to stop because our teenagers have no clue what to do. They are afraid. They are afraid to walk in their own communities because they are afraid of someone perceiving them as being a criminal or doing something wrong when they're not. So that's just something that we definitely need to think about and, and what I've asked people to do is don't wait till it happens to you or someone that you know. Use this as examples. Use our family's tragedies as examples to say there has to be a better way. There has to be a better law. We have to clean this thing up. And, and I feel it started here in Florida, and it should end here in Florida because our teenagers are afraid. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I think I speak for the entire commission uh, when I say that uh, we really have been very honored to be able to host this hearing. It's a subject of great importance, as all concerned can see. I think it provided a significant, significant opportunity for us to engage in not debate, I don't think it's simply debate, but in deep reflection in a very frank and open and honest way about a very important issue in the judicial system. And I want to thank the state for coming to us with the spirit of cooperation and engagement. Um, we can offer you our commitment 
to continue to support the dialogue and we urge you also to continue to dialogue. We can support in any way that we can, including the work of our rapporteurships, because as you have learned, we have several which are interested, including my own uh, persons of African descent. And even earlier this morning, and indeed with some of the victims who were young persons, the rapporteur and the rights of the child, we also have. So I think we can offer our commitment to continue to support this dialogue and, and to support a, a resolution that is in accordance with human rights at the end. So thank you all and good day.